Hello and welcome back to the Consistory of the Coelk YouTube channel. I'm your host for this video, Reverend Jake Zabel, the St. John's Evangelical Lutheran Church located in Dolby, Queensland, Australia. We're joined again here on the Bible study couch, which is what I use to have my more relaxed Bible studies rather than my more formal lectures that I do on this channel. And today's Bible study is going to be on the Table of Nations. And so this comes from Genesis chapter 10 after the flood, and you have Noah's three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, and how their children went and scattered across the globe post-flood. Now, I've, I've made a chart of where uh, some of these people spread to. Now, this is not going to be 100% accurate. This is based on my own interpretation of where I think people went, and I'm going to basically stick that up on the screen and probably zoom in or have arrows pointing to particular groups at particular times as we talk about them. But the main thing is there is no 100% accuracy as to where all of these people went. Now some of them we can we can definitively point to, like someone like Cush, because we know where the Cushites lived because they took the name, or Mizraim, which is just the Hebrew word for uh, is, uh, Egypt, so we know where they went. Uh, Cana, we know where they went. Uh, guys like Nimrod, Arpasad, uh, we know where they went because the Bible can give us kind of exact locations as to their went. Um, beyond that, we don't really know where people ended up, but many scholars for millennia have tried to determine exactly where people went. And so these will be based on um, numerous resources, but for this particular study, I'm basing this on the Jewish historian uh, Josephus, or Flavius Josephus, um, the Jewish historian from the first century, and also on the writing of Martin Luther from his Genesis commentary, where Luther himself goes through the Table of Nations. He does uh, pick up a lot from Josephus, but he does, in certain places, may add more information or have his own opinions where he disagrees with Josephus. Uh, I've also grabbed some material from the Genesis account commentary written by John Safati of, I believe, Creation Ministries International. Um, he's one of those creation science groups, and this is, this is really important because a lot of the creation science groups have given their own theories as to where people have went. Uh, Answers in Genesis has their own thing, Creation Research has their own thing, Creation Ministry International has their own thing, individual scientists will have their own interpretations, so don't, don't take this as gospel fact. Um, I, I, I myself will, in certain cases with certain people, I'll say um, they may have gone here, they may have gone here, some people say they went here, some people say they went here, uh, it's possibly they went here, it's more likely they went here, it's probable they could have gone here as well. So I, I, I keep this rather vague, um, focusing more on certain regions uh, rather than exact locations. And so, yeah, because everybody has their own interpretation. You look at all the different scholars, you look at all the different creation scientists who look at it these days, and there's so many different theories about who went where, when, and why, and what, and all of that. So, I'm just going to go based mostly on uh, Josephus, um, because he is a first century Jew, so this gives you at least where the first century Jews believed these peoples went, and that gives us a bit more accuracy because it's a lot closer to the dates than more modern people. Um, but then I want to take Luther, who then would have some bit more information, uh, since Josephus himself was kind of restricted to, like, the Roman Empire in the knowledge he knew. So Luther, you know, they knew about the Americas, they knew about Asia, they knew about a lot more of the globe than Josephus would have t probably known about. So Luther can add in some extra information plus some more what was a genetic scientific information that would have been around in Luther's day and again then bringing in like John Safati uh, as someone from the modern era who can throw in a bit more modern information as well on top of that as well so we're going to work with that and so I just want to begin by going through the list given in Genesis and I apologize uh, for my pronunciation on names uh, people do pronounce names differently and sometimes I just can't pronounce the names anyway so I'm gonna do my best so bear with me 
uh, let's begin by looking at the study. So first up you have JPETH. Now there is some disagreement, I will discuss this later on, on the translation in, in Genesis. It does seem to say that Ham is the youngest of Noah's sons, um, but there's some disagreement as to whether Shem or Japheth were the oldest. Now, if you watch that terrible Noah movie, the, the really unbiblical one, they have Shem being the oldest, Ham being the middle, and Japheth being the youngest. I don't know how they get that. The Bible is clear that Ham is the youngest. Um, this is referenced in, let me just find the verse, uh, Genesis 9.24. It explicitly says that Ham was the youngest son of Noah. But Genesis 10.21, it, it's, the Hebrew is not 100% clear, and so different translators will translate it different ways. They'll either say, Japheth, the eldest of Shem, or Japheth, Shem is the eldest, and, and something along those lines. So there's disagreement over whether Japheth or Shem was the uh, oldest. If you look at a lot of the older translations of the Bible, like the King James and like Luther's Bible, they take the interpretation that Japheth was the oldest. So thus it was Japheth, Shem, Ham. Uh, a lot more modern translations tend to tr change the translation there and say that Shem was actually the oldest. And largely that goes in the fact that Shem is the one who inherits the, you know, the messianic line that it comes to Noah and then it's through Shem down to his sons through to Abraham, but then it's very likely that Abraham actually isn't the oldest son of of his uh, father either, so it doesn't necessarily, I mean, and you got, you know, Isaac is not the firstborn of Abraham, although he is the one of the covenant, uh, but then, you know, Jacob is not the oldest and neither is um, Judah, so you get the fact that the Messianic promise doesn't always go through the oldest, so the possibility that, it, that Shem is the second and the Messianic line went through him is very likely a possibility. It, Shem doesn't have to be the oldest. But just just going on, we, we, we start with um, what's given in Scripture, and it normally goes Japheth, Ham, Shem in the Table of Nations. And so Japheth has seven sons. Um, his oldest is Goma. Goma is then said to have three sons, uh, Ashkenaz, uh, Repath and Togama. Uh, then his second son is Magog. Third son of Japheth is Mardai. Uh, the fourth son of Japheth is Javan. And then he's listed with a couple of sons Alasha, Tarshish, Kittum, and Dondim. Uh, then the next sons of Japheth are Tubu, uh, Meshech, and Taras. Uh, then we move on to Ham. Now Ham is said to have four sons. Um, Actually, I think that hold on, yeah, there's, there's four sons. Uh, the first is, is Cush. Now, Cush is said to have um, uh, six sons. Uh, the first five are mentioned in the Table of Nations is Seba, Havala, Sabata, Ramah. And then Ramah is said to have two sons, Sheba and Dendan. Uh, De Dedan? Dedan? Something like that, Dedan. Uh, and then there is uh, Shabteka is the next son of Cush. And these are the ones mentioned there first. And then later it mentions it has another son named Nimrod. So that Nimrod is not listed in this first list, but then mentioned as being the son of Cush. After that, we have Mizraim or Egypt. And he's got a bunch of sons as well. Uh, I think he has seven. There's Ludim, An Anamim, Lehabim, uh, Nat. Tufim, uh, Pasurim, uh, Kalusim, with, from the way the Philistines come, and Kafatorim. Now, interestingly, those names are all plural names, and in fact, the name uh, Kafator is mentioned in a different part of the Bible in the singular. So, it's possible here that when it's using all the plural, the ims here, that we're not literally naming the sons of of Egypt, but that these are the like the tribes of Egypt, the Ludim tribe, the, like the, the Luds people, as we might say. Um, but we'll get to that later. Uh, next is Put, and then last is Cana. And then Cana is actually quite um, prosperous. He has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 
11 sons. Ooh, not quite 12. Have I counted that right? That's 3, 6, 9, 11. Yeah, he has 11 sons. Not quite 12. But Canaan's sons are Sidon, uh, Heth. Uh, then that's just, again, these are like tribes. Jebusites, Amorites, Girgashites, Hivites, Arcanites, Shinites, Avadites, Zemarites, Hamathites. So again, these could be talking more about tribes. And so that could be a possible number of reasons when you talk about tribes rather than um, individual names, in the fact that maybe the tribes adopted names not the same as their actual son. So it could be like, look, we don't know the exact name of the third son of Cana, but he was the ancestor of the Jebusites. So maybe his name was Jebus um, or Jebus, um, but may maybe it's just the Jebusites or Jebusites came from him. And so we don't know his actual name. So that's a possibility there. Uh, then we get on to Shem, and he has five sons. There's Elam, uh, Ashur, or Assyria. There's Apasad, from where we get the Chaldeans. And that Apasad being the, the ancestor of Abraham. And th this here is important. Like, as I just mentioned before, that Shem is possibly the second son of Noah rather than the first, and that the messianic line has nothing to do with um, the firstborn is quite evident here in the fact that Apasad is the third son of Shem and yet he's the one that has the messianic line. And so from Apasad we get Shalah. Uh, we only get one son of Shalah mentioned which is uh, Eber or Heber from where we get the, the term Hebrews. Um, and then he's mentioned as having two sons, uh, Peleg and Jokten. And then Jokten, he is also a very prosperous person with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 tribes. Uh, Elmoda, uh, Sheflaf, Hazamaveth, Gerah, uh, Hadoram, uh, uh, Uzal, Dikla. Obul, uh, Abi Ma'al, Sheba, Orpha, Havala, and Jobab. And you can see some of these names actually coming up again, like Sheba and Havala. Um, you know, they have uncles with those names. Uh, and then the next son of Shem is Lud, and then the next son after that is Aram. And this is where we get all the Arameans, and he has Uz, Hul, Jepha, and then depending on your translation, or the, depending on the manuscript, mother, either Mash or Meshech. And depends on what translation. Well, not really translation. Depends on the manuscript that is used in your translation. So those are all the people we're going to talk about now. So how about we get underway with trying to identify who these people are and where they spread out as part of the Table of Nations. So the first one we're going to talk about is Japheth. Now, especially if you look at something like uh, creation science, they'll talk about how Japheth seems to be the ancestor of the lighter-skinned races, such as the um, Europeans and the Asians, so people with lighter, fairer skin. Uh, there is some argument about the name Japheth meaning fair or pale in Hebrew, and that could be where that's from. Uh, then we also no, then there's the idea that Shem is more what they call the middle brown, like your Arabians and your Indians, that kind of middle brown skin tone, and then that uh, Ham has the much darker skin tones, like your Africans and people like that. Um, this actually isn't something that's just like something new um, in creation science. Luther actually talks about this in his Genesis commentary where he says the word that he said that Kush or Ham, uh, the Hamites are the Negro race, or is he news? I don't know if he uses the word race because they didn't really have that kind of uh, Darwinian understanding yet. But it is understood that darker skinned people came from Ham, lighter skinned people came from Japheth, and those in the middle came from Shem. And that's kind of been an understanding not only modern days, but kind of throughout the history of the church. And a lot of this has to do with just basically the fact of where people spread to. Where Japheth's, and Japheth's descendants seem to have spread up into Europe. 
um, Ham's descendants descent, uh, decided to spread down into Africa, and Shem's descendants stayed around that kind of Arabia, Turkey, um, or Anatolia, that kind of area. And so we're going to get to that. And so Japheth, in the Bible, his descendants are called the people of the coastlands. So that means they, they hugged the coastlands. Uh, now this would originally be referring to the Mediterranean Sea, but can also be included with the Caspian and the Black Seas. Uh, particularly when we get to some of the people like Ashkenaz and Torgamar and some of these others, where they do get mentioned in the Bible being located up around Mount Ararat and up in the Caucasus regions. So they wouldn't be near the Mediterranean, they would be near the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So when they're called people of the coastlands, they're, they're up near those seas. So up in that Caucasus region. Um, See, Noah prophesied as well that Japheth's people would be enlarged, being the most populous. And this does seem to be the case, since uh, the Japhethic peoples are connected with the, um, the southern and eastern Europeans, I mean all Europeans, but particularly as of the writing of Genesis, they're connected with kind of that south and east Europe. Uh, they would have later migrated into West and North Europe, but that would be something that came later, not right away after the kind of the flood and the Tower of Babel. It would have taken some time for them to spread into Scandinavia and Britain. Uh, but there is the they're the Europeans, there's the Caucasian people, they're the steppe people, um, and Luther, Luther in his commentary, he says that Japheth is the ancestor of the Medes, the Scythians, the Tatars, the Chimerians, the Poles, the Vandals, the Danes, the Germans, the Greeks, the Italians, the French, and the, Span the Spaniards. So, pretty far-spreading. Um, when you include groups like the Scythians and the Tatars, and that, that's including the steppes, and that's spreading out into Central Asia, into Mongolia, uh, Manchuria, and Asia. So that includes, like, Luther's alluding that, basically, Japheth went all the way from Europe right across through Russia into Asia. Uh, the Japhethic people are connected with fair-skinned people and they would be the ancestors of the Europeans and also the Asians. It is also believed historically, so this isn't something that's included in uh, either the Bible or even Luther's day because Luther didn't know much about this at that time since the Americas were new to him. Um, but it is believed that the natives of North and South America, so your Native Americans or your American Indians, as they're sometimes originally called, uh, but also like your Mayans, your Aztecs, your Incas, or your people in South America there, um, it is believed that they are descended from like your Mongolian um, East Asian people, that there was a period of time where they crossed over from kind of East Asia Across, kind of East Africa, or Africa, sorry, I got that really wrong, uh, East Russia, Russia and Africa are not the same, but they, they went from East Russia and crossed back when there was a land bridge into Alaska, and then from there went down into Canada, into um, United States, Mexico, Latin America, and, and filled that area that way. So, in th this case, um, your Americans would also be Japhethic. Um, and then we get to the Polynesian peoples of the Pacific. Uh, they are also descended from East Asians. It's, it's believed that like your Polynesians were like the original inhabitants of the island of Taiwan and that they spread out from there to places like Hawaii, New Zealand and um, Indonesia and all those places. So you actually have a rather far-reaching uh, Japhethic line. And so this would be in keeping with that prophecy of Noah concerning Japheth that he would be enlarged, that his descendants would basically be the most widespread because they fill Europe, they fill Asia, they fill the Americas, they fill the Pacific. And so Japheth is rather well spread out. Now the first son that gets mentioned is Goma. This is the oldest son of Japheth. Now in the book of Ezekiel 38.6, it just says Goma is living in the north. And so, where is north? Well, north is generally not just north of Israel, but kind of north. When they refer to north here, they're meaning like the Caucasus regions, that area north of the Tigris and the Euphrates. Uh, the Greek 
uh, historian Herodotus connected Goma with the Chimerians. Uh, these are those who lived in the north of the Caucasus regions. Uh, and so they probably would have... Goma, I mean, Goma's sons are going to get mentioned here. It's pretty much a Goma pretty much filled that North Caucasus, East Europe region and probably spread from there. Um, see, Luther himself connected Goma with East, the Eastern Europeans and also the West Asians. So kind of where that, kind of where like Russia is located now and like Belarus, Ukraine, that kind of area. Uh, Josephus himself went on to connect Goma with the people of Gaul and the Germanic peoples. Uh, and John Safati in his uh, Genesis commentary, the Genesis account, he connects Goma with the ancestors of the Welsh and the early people of Britain. Um, I mean, as we're going to see, Goma's people, um, like Ashkenaz, uh, Rapath, and Togoma, like, they're pretty much Goma went into that East... East Europe area and of course he would have spread out from there like his children would have spread throughout Europe um, the sca into Scandinavia into Germany uh, into France into Britain and Ireland and places like that so it's really it's Goma's children there now we we get more specific with the three sons of Goma that are mentioned and the first one is Ashkenaz and this is actually where we get the word Ashkenazi kind of an old term for Germanic peoples uh, Jeremiah 51.27 connects Ashkenaz with Mount Ararat. That basically, they stayed put. That Ashkenaz himself basically lived around Mount Ararat. So this is in modern day Armenia. And so this is again in that Caucasus region. Um, it could be sense that if you got Ashkenaz, if Japheth is the oldest, and then Goma is the oldest of Japheth, and then Ashkenaz is the oldest of Goma, it would kind of make sense that they kept the original land inhabited at Mount Ararat. So they, you know, Noah lands the ark on Mount Ararat, and then he probably sets up a little vineyard, he sets up his vineyard straight away, and who's going to inherit that? Well, his oldest son Japheth, and who will inherit that? His oldest son Goma, who's going to inherit that? His oldest son Ashkenaz. So Ashkenaz seems to be, biblically speaking, connected with Armenia. Yet, scholars believe that Ashkenaz is very one of these far-spreading um, groups. And it's interesting when we get into this idea of the Aryan race, and I'm not talking about the Nazis here, I'm talking about like the actual Aryan people. They're an Indo-European group. It's believed that a lot of the Europeans and also the like North Indian people, you Persian area, although we're going to get into the Medes in a second, that that kind of from the Caucasus this is why we call white people Caucasians, that there was like this proto group that started around um, the Caucasus regions and can spread out from there. And that's generally regarded as the Aryan people. Um, and so it would make sense that if Ashkenaz is connected, if these people are connected with Ashkenaz, that they start there at Mount Ararat and then they spread out from there. So, because you have Eusebius, um, the, his, the church historian Eusebius in like the three, four, five hundreds, whenever he lived, uh, he talks about Ashkenaz being the ancestor of the Goths and the Germanic peoples. Uh, Luther also held to the this by saying that we Germans were descended from the firstborn of the firstborn son of Japheth. Um, and he then says that Japheth is the firstborn son of Noah. And I've talked about this, uh, that based on what translation you have of Genesis 10.21, either Japheth or Shem is the oldest. Ham is definitely the youngest. But Luther is saying that we Germans are descended from Noah's firstborn, and so it went from Noah to Japheth to Goma to Ashkenaz, the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn, and that's where the German people come from. Now, there more for it is quite possible that the Aryan race comes from uh, Ashkenaz. The Ashkenazis, the Aryans, they're all the same people. Uh, now, with this, this is why I want to put on a, um, a condition here, because there might be certain people like your white supremacists, Nazis, those people, they might go, ah, see, the Aryans come from Ashkenaz, and Ashkenaz was the firstborn of Goma. Goma was the firstborn of 
Japheth. Japheth is the firstborn of Noah, therefore we're the best. Actually, Luther addresses this question already in his Genesis commentary, even before you got this kind of white supremacist or ethnic politics even happening, where Luther argues that he says that anyone who has the opinion that we Germans, as he calls us, uh, would be somehow superior because we're the firstborn of the firstborn, he goes, they, he says, do not give us, he says, oh, hold on, Luther says, the reason that us Germans are the the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn does not give us reason to glory before God. He says, instead, it is only by the grace of God that we are called by the gospel to salvation. So Luther's like, look, it's very most likely that us Germans, and I'm going to include us Germans there because I, uh, Zabel, I am of Germanic descent. Uh, my ancestors were German, so I can include with Luther, we Germans, that we, it's very possible that we Germans were Ashkenazis, we're descended from Ashkenaz, the firstborn of Goma, the firstborn of Japheth, the firstborn of Noah. And Luther says, that's not a reason to boast. The fact that you're descended from the firstborn of the firstborn of the firstborn is nothing before God. Race doesn't mean anything here. It doesn't matter if you're the firstborn of the firstborn. Fact is, it is only by the grace of God calling you through the gospel that you are anything. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're white, black, Asian, Indian, brown, whatever whatever you want to say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're the firstborn of Noah, the lastborn of Noah, it doesn't matter whether you're Japhetic, Hermetic, or Semitic. It means nothing if you don't have the gospel. If you aren't a Christian, it doesn't matter what race you are. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. Because if you don't have the gospel, you're nothing. And so, actually, we should thank God that he actually sent the gospel out to us. Because guess what? Until Jesus Christ came along and sent out his apostles into the world to take the gospel beyond the borders of the Roman Empire, us Germanic people, us Goths, us Ashkenazis, we didn't have the gospel. We were all going to hell. Um, we were doomed. It is only thanks to the effort of the Jewish apostles that took that gospel message, spread it throughout the Roman Empire, and that their disciples, whether they be Jew or Gentile, then took that beyond the reaches of the Roman Empire into the Germanic regions, and it is through them that I today get to call myself a Christian. It is by the grace of God through the working of those men that I am a Christian. It is through the work of them that I am anything. And so it doesn't matter whether the Germans were the firstborn or the firstborn or the firstborn. It doesn't matter whether Shem or Japheth are the oldest. Because in the end, that means nothing. The question is not whether you're born of Shem, whether you're born of Japheth, whether you're born of Ham, whether you're born of the firstborn of Japheth, whether you're born of the secondborn of Japheth. It means absolutely nothing unless you have the gospel. And so, as Luther says, the fact that we Germans are the firstborn or the firstborn or the firstborn, that does not give us a reason to boast. We boast only in the gospel. We boast that by the grace of God, we have been called to Christ. And that is what we boast in. Doesn't matter what race or ethnicity or lineage you have, it means nothing before God. And with that kind of disclaimer out the way, let's get back on with this study because the next son mentioned is Gomer's second son, uh, uh, Ripath. Uh, now Luther held that Ripath is not mentioned elsewhere in scripture but that he probably lived in Northwest Europe. Um, so that would be like your people, that kind of your early Britons and your um, Celtic peoples. That's, that's you know, Goma's, per, Goma's people spread into Europe. Somewhere of Goma's line had to spread into, you know, Western Europe. Um, Josephus himself, he identified uh, Ripath with the uh, Rapirians. Uh, later known as the uh, Paphalagonians. Uh, they lived on the Black Sea between Bithynia and Pontus. It was kind of not the same as Northwest Europe, like what Luther suggested, but then again, who knows exactly where they lived. And the last one mentioned here of Gomer's children is Torgama. Now, Torgama is mentioned in both Ezekiel 27.14 and Ezekiel 
uh, 38 6 where he's connected with the land of Gog and we're gonna get to Gog and Magog in a minute uh, Josephus connected Togoma with the Phrygians in Western Anatolia, that's modern-day Turkey. Uh, however, Luther connected Togoma and Gog with the Tatars living around the area of Crimea, uh, so modern-day Ukraine. Uh, they are thus possibly located in the Caucasus regions or, uh, you know, more likely the northern Caucasus regions, and so it's possible that Togoma is the ancestor of the original Eastern Europeans. Now, getting on to the next one, this one is very interesting, is Magog. So Magog, along with his brothers Meshach and Tubal, are referenced in Ezekiel 38.2, with Magog ruling over Meshach and Tubal. So we can see here that Magog is eventually going to rule over his brothers, or his children will rule over their cousins, essentially. Now, Josephus and Luther both identified Magog with the Scythians. And who are the Scythians? Uh, these are essentially the steppe people, those of Central Asia in places like Kazakhstan and southern Russia. Uh, it is from the steppe people that we get the Mongolians and the Manchurians, your Eastern Asians. Uh, and these are all descended from the steppes, and thus they'd be descended from Magog. So the Magogites um, would possibly be your Central and East Asians, your Chinese, your Japanese, your Vietnamese, um, Tibetans, pretty much everyone in that area is probably descended from Magog. Uh, and then from those people, it is believed, as I mentioned above, that the inhabitants of North and South America, so your Inuits, your Native Americans, your Aztecs, your Incans, your Mayans, any other group that lived in that area, all probably descended from your East Asians who crossed over from East Russia into Alaska. And that would then make Magog the ancestor of also those natives of North and South America. Uh, it's also believed, as I mentioned above, that the Polynesian peoples of the Pacific, such as your natives of Hawaii and the Maoris of New Zealand, that they originated from the island of Taiwan. And thus, the Polynesians may also be descendants from Magog. This then makes Magog the most widespread of the descendants of Japheth, with his descendants going all the way from kind of uh, Western Asia, Eastern Europe, into Central Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands, and even as far as North and South America. So, it's kind of got like two-thirds of the globe were originally inhabited by Magog and his descendants, so he is the most widespread. Um, the next son we talk about is the third son of Japheth, Madai. Now, Madai is the Hebrew word for the Medes. Uh, they lived in north of Persia. Uh, Josephus identified Madai with the Medes, and in verses like Daniel 6.15, where the Bible speaks of the Medes and the Persians, it just uses the word Madai. Uh, so Madai is just the Persians. So this is interesting, because as we'll get to later, the Persians are descended from the Elamites, uh, and these were Semitic people. That's from, I believe, was that correct? Uh, Elam, yes, was the, the firstborn son of Shem. So the Persians are Semitic people, Whereas the Medes are Japhetic people, and they end up forming this um, Midian Persian Empire. So you've got this mixing there of the sons of Japheth and the sons of Shem into this great empire. Um, today, because uh, Persia today is Iran, the country of Iran actually was previously known as the country of Persia, they changed their name, but the Medes would probably be the lighter skinned Iranians, with the Persians being the more brown-skinned Iranians. Like, if you if you go to Iran, uh, it is kind of a mixed bag of people there. There are people that are more Arabian and people that are more kind of Caucasian. And so it would be that the Medes would be your Caucasians and your uh, Persians would be your Arabian people in, in Iran. So that's kind of the history of the Persian Empire. Um, that it's, yeah, it's kind of a mixing of Japhetic and Semitic people. Now the next one, and this is an interesting one to get to, um, because we talked about um, Japheth being the people of the coastlands, and I mentioned that that kind of really focuses on the Mediterranean. We're going to get to Javan. 
and this is really the ancestor of the Mediterranean peoples. Uh, Josephus connected Javan with the Anoans uh, and the proto gracians so like the early people of Greece, your Mycenaeans, your Minoans, those people. Uh, Luther taught that Javan and his son spread across the Mediterranean from Anatolia to Iberia, uh, and thus they included the Greeks, the Italians, and the Spaniards. Uh, exactly how this breaks down is what we're about to discuss now, where the oldest son of Javan is Elisha, and Elisha is mentioned in Ezekiel 27 verse 7 as being on the coast, and many have connected it with a part of the island of Cyprus. Now when we get down to it later, so I'm going to talk about Cyprus again, but we'll first focus on the second son of Javan, uh, Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is a well-known port city mentioned throughout Scripture. Tarshish was known as being like one of the greatest seafaring uh, societies of the, the ancient world there. You've got Jonah gets on a ship at Joppa to head to Tarshish. You've got Solomon getting ships of Tarshish and then taking them across land to use them in the Red Sea so he could trade with India. Um, so the ships of Tarshish were kind of like your grade A ships, like today we kind of think is America as one of the greatest sea powers and before them the British Empire, you know, Britannia rules the waves and there were periods of time like the Phoenicians were the greatest seafaring people or the Romans were a great seafaring people, but prior to all of them, Tarshish was the great seafaring people of, of the times of like King Solomon and stuff like that, that Tarshish Tarshus, that, that was the great sea-faring people. And where exactly they lived, nobody knows. There is many arguments about Tarshus being somewhere in Anatolia or Greek. Uh, some people connect it with Tarsus, uh, like the place where um, St. Paul or Saul of Tarshus is where he came from. So some people connected it there. Uh, but it does seem that Tarsus seems to be a lot further out. Luther and Josephus thought that Tarsus was on the island of Sicily. But one of the most common places where scholars today think Tarsus was is on the Iberian Peninsula, or in modern-day Spain, right down the bottom, right near Gibraltar, around that area is where they think Tarsus was located. And one of the main supports for this is the Book of Jonah, in which Jonah was told by God to go from Israel to Nineveh, so over in Assyria, and that's to the east. And then Jonah instead tries to get on a boat and head to Tarshish and in the west. And so it would make sense if Tarshish is in Spain, because that's like the furthest west you can go before you head off into the Atlantic Ocean. And so it would make sense that Jonah, who's trying to get away from Nineveh, would go to essentially the ends of the earth to get away from it. He's going as far west as possible. And so it does seem likely that Tarshish is probably in Spain. And if that is the case, then Tarshish is probably the ancestor of the Spanish people. And so then we move on to Kittim. Now, Kittim is just the Hebrew word for the island of Cyprus. So obviously, Kittim is the ancestor of the uh, Cypriots. Um, the fact that Alasar seems to be connected with Cyprus as well, is it possible that Kittim and Alasar shared the island? The fact that the island would eventually be named Kittim probably means that Kittim ended up being the, like, the dominant uh, figure on that island. Now, the last son of Javan is Dondaim, and nobody really knows about where he is. Uh, Luther held that Dondaim uh, perished and that nobody knows where he ended up. Basically, because no scholars in Luther's day really knew where Dondaim ended up. Um, Josephus doesn't even mention him, which is more reason why Luther said he perished and nobody knows what happened to his people, because Josephus doesn't even make mention of him in his History of the Jews. However, many scholars have pointed out the fact that there are variations in the Hebrew manuscripts, and many Hebrew manuscripts rather than having Dondaim, have Rodaim. And because of that, many people have thought that his name was Rodaim, and they've connected him with the island of Rhodes. And so he would be the ancestor of the people of the island of Rhodes. So that is one theory. We don't really know. Now, the next son is Tubal. Now, Tubal and Meshach, as these next two sons of Goma I mentioned above, they are connected with Margob, as 
Magog as belonging in the north, with Magog ruling over them. Now, Josephus connected Tubal with the Tolibites, uh, later called the Iberus, uh, those who lived in Iberia or Spain. Although this seems rather unlikely since the Bible does connect Tubal with Magog. And we already know that Magog is kind of in the Caucasus steppe regions, up in the kind of Kazakhstan area. And so it would seem weird that Josephus would be like, Ah, oh, Tubal's he's the ancestor of the Iberians. That that doesn't make sense when the Bible places Magog um, in the north of Israel and says that Tubal is up near Magog because then Iberia is is, is west of, of Israel, so it's not north of Israel, so that doesn't really make sense, especially since earlier you had Josephus connecting Magog with the Scythian people and and that ump in the Caucasus uh, Central Asian area and then he goes, ah, oh, and then Tubal, he, he's, he's over in Iberia, in Spain. It doesn't make any sense when the Bible says that Tubal and Magog lived near each other. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with Josephus here, and instead I'm going to go with Luther. Uh, Luther himself just said that Tubal was connected with the Tatars, uh, the people up in that kind of Central Asian area. Um, many have connected Tubal with the Tobal River, in modern-day Kazakhstan. So it is possible that Tubal is more likely the ancestor of the Kazakhs and the people of Kazakhstan and that area and not the ancestor of the Spaniards. Uh, Meshek is also connected with Magog and Tubal living up in that area. Um, Josephus, however, connected him with the Cappadocians in Western Anatolia. Now Luther referenced Psalm 120 verse 5 where it speaks of the lands of Meshek and Kadar. Now, Kadar was one of the desert areas where the Moabites, the Edomites, and the Ammonites lived. Thus, Luther himself places Meshek in the area north of Kadar in eastern Anatolia, so a different area. So it is possible that Meshek most likely lived in the kind of southern Caucasus Anatolian region. I mean, there is also the possibility that, as I said, uh, the fourth son of Aram is Mash or Meshek, and so maybe the Meshek mentioned in Psalm 120 is referring to the Semitic people rather than to, you know, rather than referring to this Japhetic people, which would make more sense when you have the Edomites, the Moabites, and the Ammonites living in that area. Um, but yeah, it seems to be that Meshek again, with his connection to Tubal and Magog, places him in rather that Caucasus region. Uh, and the last, last son of Goma is Tarus. Now, Luther states that nobody knows where Tarus is. Some people have tried to suggest that he's, he's connected with Tarsus and Tar Tarsus and stuff like that. Uh, Josephus, however, connects Tarus with the Tarisians, or as he calls them, the Thracians. Now, the Thracians are those who lived in Macedonia and the areas north of Greece, and they are probably the ancestors of the Slavic peoples in the Balkans. So, you're kind of your Estonian... No, sorry, I've got that wrong. That's the Baltics. Um, the Balkans, you know, your, your Croats, your Serbs, those people are, are your Slavs in the Balkans. Let's not confuse the Balkans and the Baltics. It's possible that they're descended from Taurus, the seventh son of Goma. So, as I write here in my summary, we'll wrap up this study. Let's, let's do this Table of Nations as a three-part study. Today we'll focus on Japheth, and then tomorrow, um, tomorrow, next study, whenever I get that study done, we will do Ham, and then the study after that will do Shem. So, let's just summarize the descendants of Japheth. So, in summary, Japheth has seven sons, and they can div be divided as this. Goma is the ancestor of the Western, Northern, and Eastern European peoples. Javan is the ancestor of the Southern Europeans, your Hispanics, your Italians, your Greeks. Taras is possibly the ancestor of the Slavic peoples. Magog is the ancestor of the Central and East Asians, and from there, possibly also the Polynesians and the Native Americans. 
Tubal is the ancestor of the Northern Caucasus people, including your Eastern Europeans and your West Asians. Madai is the ancestor of the Medes and the Southern Caucasus peoples, and Meshek is also the ancestor of the Southern Caucasus peoples. The peoples of Tubal and Meshek, however, were later assimilated into the people of Magog, and the people of Madai would be later assimilated into the Persians in the Median Persian Empire. So that kind of wraps up this Bible study on the Table of Nations, part one, on the the descendants of Japheth. Join me again next time when we pick up on the descendants of Ham. I've been your host, Reverend Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.